Hello and welcome back to another Aspects of Archaeology. In today's episode, we're going to be examining GIS. Oh, give us a GIS. <laughs> no, no, Helga, not KISS. GIS, G-I-S, Geographic Information Systems or Geographic Information Science. It's a tool which helps archaeologists to tackle a huge problem that they face almost every day. In order to better understand the past, archaeologists collect and make use of a wealth of data from excavations. No observation is too small and no feature is irrelevant. Excavation is essentially the process of gathering data, and the more data, the better. And what's more, all of this data is augmented by a broader context, the relationship between artifacts, features, sites, environment and changes in the environment all inform the interpretation of a site. But how best to collate this information? How can we make it useful, understandable and applicable to other archaeological investigations, ones which we may not have a hand in? Well, there's always good old-fashioned talking, but it's very hard to communicate a mass of data in a casual conversation. What about writing a report in a journal? This is a good start, but most people don't have time to read every journal, and finding the data they want and need might be like finding a needle in a haystack. Ah, the old staple, writing a book. Books can be easily catalogued and cross-referenced. However, they do go out of date. They also combine and synthesize data, presenting the author's opinion, rather than presenting data for analysis. This is where GIS comes in. Geographic information systems allow a mass of data to be stored, presented, and analyzed. Such endeavors are not new. Here is a map of the landscape and context of Avery in the 18th century. However, the advantage of GIS is the ability to compute, analyze, and present spatial relationships and data in a way not possible with traditional maps. So, the burning question I can hear you thinking is what is GIS, and just how does it apply to archaeology? Geographic Information Systems, or GIS, are designed to capture, store, analyze, and present all kinds of geographical data. In essence, they are a combination of various disciplines, including cartography, or map-making, statistical analysis, or the ability to extrapolate meaning from data, and the application of database technology to store and aid the analysis of data. This combination allows users to develop complicated questions and analyses, employing truly huge amounts of data. An early combination of statistics and geography took place in London in 1854. Dr. John Snow was concerned by an outbreak of cholera. He began recording individual instances of cholera with points on a map. This map eventually led him to identify the source of the outbreak, a contaminated water pump opposite the pub which now bears his name. Such remarkable analyses only became easier through the 20th century with the development of ordnance survey maps. By the 1950s, data and analysis could readily be applied to urban locations, and today detailed maps are available of even the most far-flung of places. These decades also saw leaps and bounds in the development of computer technology and computerized analysis. They even saw the arrival of the portable computer. Because of the nature of our discipline, employing masses of data, geographical spaces, and also the understanding of data through time, archaeologists were some of the earliest adopters and developers of GIS technology. It is also a cost-effective, safe, and accurate analysis tool, and can even be employed in the study of maritime archaeology without the need to get wet. In a GIS, data is presented and computed using raster and vector modeling. These are essentially two ways of capturing and presenting real-world data. A vector model uses points, lines, and areas to represent spatial data. 
This is great for representing non-continuous data, such as boundaries or binary relationships. This is water. This is land. Raster modeling is based on square cells and is great for representing continuous data, such as frequencies of artifacts or changes in vegetation. Different values are afforded different colors or shades, and shifts in data over space or time can be easily represented and understood. These are the two main ways that data is represented in a geographic information system. GIS not only stores and represents data, but it has changed the way archaeologists think about data, and therefore how they think about space. Geographic information systems have two main applications in archaeology, survey and analysis. Accurate surveys and documentation are crucial for locating and preserving archaeology in the landscape. GIS allows at-risk sites to be monitored, the encroachment of vegetation for example. Survey can even be used to model and predict the possible locations of unknown archaeological sites. Survey data can be made available to planning authorities and the public via the HER, for example. And this data can be used to inform planning decisions or inform future research agendas. GIS even allows immediate access to survey data, sometimes on site. This can aid the interpretation of an ongoing excavation as it unfolds and allow quick reference to the broadest of contexts for the smallest of finds. For analysis, GIS makes multiple layers of data available for complex and in-depth study. Intrasite or within-site spatial analysis can be performed. The use of rooms, for example, inferred, or analysis of the distribution of finds across a campsite. This micro-scale analysis allows the use and function of space across a site to be interpreted and inferred. A hydrological analysis examines the flow and location of water in a site or landscape, and also how those locations and flows have changed over time, changing space and probably the function of the landscape. The hypsography or elevation of land can be analysed. Elevation can have a dramatic effect on the natural and the social landscape. Seasonal migrations between upper and lower lying areas are common, and also the shape of the landscape dictates how one travels across it. Also, viewshed analysis can be performed. This is the analysis of what is and is not visible from a particular point in the landscape. Such analysis allows us to understand the visual relationship between spaces, and therefore possible social significance. Catchment analysis allows us to understand the retrieval of resources at a given spot. How easy is it to get what you need? Point data in GIS is used to analyse trends in data over space in a scattergraph-like fashion. And density mapping, for example population, can reveal landscape usage. Simulation models phenomena in the landscape, revealing subtle interactions in key variables. All of these analyses allow archaeology to be studied and understood in new and exciting ways. There are, however, pitfalls, which we must be aware of. For a start, analysis is only as accurate as data, and therefore the people collecting data must be competent. Many archaeologists dismiss GIS as merely a map-making tool. This leads to disparate usage throughout the field. This is probably not helped by the fact that there are many formats, databases and programs out there. This doesn't aid understanding. Also, some GIS apologists have launched into a crusade of sorts, attempting to prove that GIS forms new theories rather than merely augmenting old techniques. This fight can be distracting. However, GIS is undeniably a useful tool which has changed archaeology forever. Right, 
time for some case studies. Now, it's actually quite hard to come up with case study data for GIS, because often the data has been produced for someone's study, and they're quite reticent about relinquishing that, uh, that material for public use, as it were. Several doctors and professors were essentially saying, but it's my data, I love my data. Quite reasonably, I suppose. However, a wonderful person, Kate Armstrong, came along and said, you can use my data, Mr. Soup, and here it is. So that's going to be case study number one. Uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing us to use that data. The second case study is actually uh, almost entirely hypothetical, but based upon some, um, well, real locations of hill forts and also some Roman roads. And then the third, uh, third case study is actually to do with... Um, uh, linear ditches in the south of England, and this is based upon a short report that I, I once read, and it's out there anyway, and it doesn't really use any um, sort of copyrighted data, so that, that should be fine to talk about. So the middle one is entirely made up. The other two are, well, the one of, the, one of them's real, and the second one is real, but not using the data. So enjoy the case studies. Our first real-life case study comes courtesy of Kate Armstrong, and is based in the Isle of Wight the study of three Neolithic monuments in their landscape. This was a visibility study. GIS was used to see what could be seen and how far away it was from each monument. This led to a discussion of associated landscapes, what these monuments were meant to be looking out upon, and indeed from where they could be seen. All three, for example, were only visible from the sea. By understanding what was visible from each monument, and which monuments were visible from where, a series of associations were built up for each. These included north and south, intervisible, near to the sea, the colour of the rock, the colour of the landscape. Although the study admits that these are somewhat subjective associations, they are nonetheless demonstrable by a GIS. These variables haven't been plucked from the air, they are statistically significant occurrences at the monuments as demonstrated by GIS. This enables a discussion of landscape usage and ritual significance which is based upon more than subjective ephemeral description. It allows that which cannot be proven to be inferred using data. Incredible. Our hypothetical case study takes place on the English-Welsh border between Cheshire and North Wales. Here, a whole host of Iron Age hill forts have been shown to be intervisible using viewshed analysis. A hydrological analysis might infer a changed coastline and boggy land 2,000 years ago. Archaeological sites and artefacts from the period appear to cluster around these hill forts, and employing a statistical algorithm might infer possible territories for each hill fort. But what's that central cluster of finds? Well, that's the Roman town of Diva, or Chester, base of the 20th Legion, and here are some Roman roads passing by the old hill forts. In this way, a landscape story has been built up using GIS data. And finally, one feature of the Bronze Age in the south of England are linear cut ditches moving through the landscape. It was suggested that such ditches were territorial markers, meant to be seen only from within their respective territories. In a way, they were like garden fences. This is my land. However, through an analysis of aspect, topography and viewshed, it has been shown that these were poor territorial markers. Sometimes they were very hard to see. More likely they marked permeable boundaries, kind of like a giant social map conveying information in the landscape. So, there you have it, GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, an incredible tool and so very useful to and for archaeologists. Not only uh, does it help us to put sites and artefacts into the biggest context imaginable, bringing a huge amount of data into, uh, into the mix and uh, allowing uh, incredibly useful analyses of that data, uh, bringing landscapes to life not only in terms of the context of a site, but also through time. Uh, but also it allows uh, historians, uh, archivists and archaeologists alike to, um, to, to infer where new sites might be, to develop new research agendas, and also actually to help look after archaeology in the landscape. It's a map for the 21st century and an incredibly um, uh, game-changing tool, as it were. Archaeology will never be the same. Uh, not only can... Um, 
GIS be used in the realm of prehistory, as the three case studies that we looked at today, but also modern archaeology, inner city archaeology, battlefield sites. GIS um, is, is, is wonderful for analysing and also just asking questions of the landscape uh, without having always to go out and uh, you know get wet or get muddy. Having said that, it will never fully replace going out and experiencing the landscape and there's a really uh, good argument to be made for actually the two in tandem. Uh, statistical analysis but also experiencing the place yourself as well. Now in the information bar below I've put a link to actually some open source soft GIST software as it were um, so you can use it um, uh, completely free, give it a go if you want to. And also as well, um, thank you once again to Kate Armstrong for donating, or rather not donating, but allowing us to use uh, that data in the case study. It was a wonderful case study to, to examine, and actually it was a pleasure to read the report. So thank you once again to Kate. So there you go. If you have any questions uh, about GIS, please do feel free to, uh, to message me at archaeosoup at gmail.com. Alternatively, visit archaeosoup.com uh, for more archaeosoup type stuff. Also, feel free to follow me on Facebook or uh, follow me on Twitter. Both of those uh, mediums are updated concurrently. And finally, once again, thank you for watching. Until next time, guys, look after yourselves and bye bye.